Hey everybody, my name is Carlo Apoglesi. I've been with, uh, I'm with IBM. I'm a global data science evangelist, also big data. I've been with IBM a couple years. Uh, prior to coming to IBM, I used to work for a company where I was a director of innovation. So I've always been dealing with emerging technologies and trends. And since I've been with IBM, I've been focused pretty much on big data, Apache Spark, and data science, and now a lot of machine learning capability. And, and today we're going to talk a little bit about what is Apache Spark and why it's really kind of something you should pay attention to and relevant to you and, and what some of the ways that you can apply this technology dealing with big data and um, some use cases, maybe ideas. So I, I, have a, I like to keep it interactive. Sorry if I'm messing with the mic. But uh, how many people here actually know what Apache Spark is? Anyone? All right, cool. How many people know what machine learning is? And how many people are data scientists? Any? Okay, we got a couple. Great, perfect. All right, this is good for me so I know the folks in the room. But also, if anybody has a question, please interrupt me. i am be happy to answer. We're going to do Q&A at the end, I think. That's the way they want me to manage it. All right, so let's get started. So we're going to be talking a little bit about the use of Apache Spark to accelerate analytics. Um, and um, so I just mentioned that. My name is Carlo. Is, the, is it going in now by chance? No? All right. I'm just sorry to keep my touch on it. All right. So today we live in the digital age. And uh, you guys know this, but everything we do, the way we live, uh, the way we play, learn, and work are affected by digital devices. So. I could tell you this much, when I uh, try to talk to my kids, they'll be in the other room. I could yell as loud as I want, they won't hear me, but if I text them, I get it back in a minute. So how we live is, is really changed, and, and how we do everything is affected by the digital age. So that really means that we have to change how we solve problems in, in business and government. Oop. So um, what this means is that digital transformation is critical. Uh, so. So no matter what industry you're in, you really have to become a data-driven business. And um, recently we did a Harvard Business Review uh, where they uh, surveyed a bunch of companies. And, and, and these are surveyed by companies. And 72% of the companies uh, were uh, basically uh, vulnerable to disruption from digital companies in the next three years. So that's pretty significant. Uh, and this is all related because of, the, you know, obviously this digital age that we're living in. All right, so the, you can't really see this too well, but we, this is what we call the data value maturity curve. And um, it really talks about making that shift to a data-driven organization has kind of these, uh, these areas of uh, stages. It starts out with operations is really efficiency gains. Well, when you use your data for, for this, you really don't get a lot of value from it. But then as you broaden into data warehousing, in reporting, you begin to get more value of this. This is where you start to apply the analytics. And then you begin to democratize that with self-service access, and, and then you get even more data and uh, I mean value out of your data. And then you monetize that with new business models. And that's what we're going to talk about, is where Apache Spark takes this idea of big data with data science and brings them together to really implement new business models. And this is where you begin to get a lot of value out of your data. So this is kind of what we, way we manage our, uh, where we talk to clients about where they are and how we kind of progress them. You don't have to really do each step. You can kind of just start right at the end, which I recommend is to build a new one right at the end. Pick one use case, build it, and go with a new business model. So um, if you look at these steps to this new business model, it really is, uh, this is kind of very basic. But it starts with clearly identifying that one use case, articulate it well, understand what you're trying to solve. Then you have to pull data together. This includes data behind your firewall, data, public data in the cloud, uh, a variety of data that's really going to be needed to solve that problem. You begin to clean and prep that data, which, which I try to, there's a lot of work that goes in that part, but um, um, there's ways to make that easier. Then you apply advanced analytics techniques. Uh, to that data, and then you begin to evaluate, deploy it, and then connect those to your digital uh, devices. So this doesn't mean it's a batch mentality. This could be all in real time, but, um, but this is the basic step to kind of understand in those new business models. 
So we talk about database evolution um, from, so I'm a big open source guy. I believe in open source. I work with clients all the time as they're embracing open source. Obviously at, at IBM, we, we, are, we are one of the top contributors in open source. If you look at the Apache Software Foundation, there's 250 top line projects. IBM contributes to almost 200 of those. So, and um, so we're heavily invested in that space because that's where innovation's happening, community-driven software. So I, I talk a lot about this as far as the database evolution. Databases were very valuable. There's a lot of interest. This chart here shows kind of, it's just Google Trends. It's really showing the searches. And you can barely see the years, but there's years along the bottom. On the left, you'll see uh, searches for database versus big data, and big data surpassed database over the last few years. And then if you go to the right and talk about the big data technology, it's really made up of two ecosystems. You know, there's a Hadoop ecosystem, it's a bunch of projects together. How many people are familiar with Hadoop? All right, cool. And Spark, and if you look, Spark is really just the last two years has, has exploded in interest. By the way, this does not mean, let me go back. The back button don't work. This does not mean market share or anything like that. This is really just interest. And when there's interest, there's obviously innovation and there's, there's community and there's d development going on, which gives you opportunity to leverage. So why is Apache Spark uh, so successful uh, uh, and why have it had all this interest? It comes down to four points. One, it, it really performs at scale. So uh, it's an in-memory architecture. It reduces disk I.O. It's, it's got a better uh, compute engine than Hadoop, MapReduce, uh, so it's much faster. It's productive. It's got uh, a concise, expressive syntax. I mean, you have, you can write a count. So the problem with MapReduce and Hadoop, you really had to build a Java application to really leverage it, and it took a lot of lines of code. But the same 100 lines of code in MapReduce and Hadoop, in three lines of code, you could do it in Spark. So it's just much easier to build things with it and much faster. There's a single programming model across a range of use cases. You know, you have a variety of APIs you can work with, whether it's streaming, uh, SQL, machine learning, they all work on a similar, on the same uh, compute engine, which I'll go over in a little bit. You have an integrated common programming language. So you can code with Python, Scala, or R. And if you think about Python and R, those are data science community driven software that's, that's growing continually and apply that with big data, you got a really good platform. It leverages all data, so uh, you can use relational data, you can connect to existing data, as well as connect to uh, unstructured data in HDFS or an object store, so it works with a variety of data sources. And it's been proven uh, fast. Community's growing. So what is Spark? So everybody kind of knows what it is, uh, but Spark is an open source, in memory, uh, distributed processing engine and for iterative analysis on massive data volumes. So, so what does that mean? We, we call it the analytic operating system. That's to kind of get your mind around it, but it is not a database. It does not persist data. HDFS, on Hadoop was a two-headed coin, had MapReduce, which is a distributed compute engine, it's like application design. Spark is similar to MapReduce. It does not have any element of persisting the data to disk or storage. It is all about analytics on the fly, and that's where you get the, uh, the value in the platform. Because it leverages your existing databases and persisted or files. So the one thing that, the reason there's so much interest in open source uh, big data technologies, because in the past with relational data warehouses, the schema had to be defined on, on right, right? So as you bring the data in, you had to understand your schema, a lot of upfront costs, you gotta do all that, and then put it into a database so that you can run a SQL query and get some results out of it. With Hadoop and Spark, the schema is defined on read. So at time that you go to grab the data, you kind of define the schema and pull that data and then you start to do some analytics on it. So the basic architecture for Spark is, um, these are the core APIs that sit on top of a distributed compute engine. That compute engine is optimized to run in memory. It has a optimizer called the Catalyst, which 
allows it to be optimized uh, based on the type of queries you run or the workload. So if you're using data frames, you get better results. But also, it's got this concept of a, a graph engine that keeps track of all of your transformations. So they, it's, a, it's a directed acyclical graph. They call it a DAG. And that DAG can actually compute a bunch of transformations together in one job, which gives you performance. But then the nice thing about it, on top of it, you get these APIs like SQL. So you, if you're familiar with SQL, you can run a bunch of SQL, do SQL transformations, and then give me back, say, give me the count at the end, and it'll run it all together in one job. Uh, you can do streaming so that you can deploy this analytics that you're applying, writing with Spark uh, in a streaming fashion. Machine learning, which is really the value, in my opinion, of Spark and where there's a lot of interest, is, is the embedded machine learning algorithms with the big data engine optimized so that it can iterate through those algorithms quickly and give you back results. And then graph, which is new, which is really nice. And that, that then those sit on top, but underneath the compute engine, which we talked about, was really just in memory. It's not a persisted layer. You have all these data sources that kind of have persisted data. Whether it's a cloud platform of, of Salesforce that you want to pull your data in from, you have connectors to connect to Salesforce, or if it's a DB2 database that's sitting in your environment, or if it's uh, object storage which has unstructured data, you can kind of pull all that stuff together into Spark and run your analytics or machine learning, and that makes it very, very powerful. So as Spark uh, is in this open source ecosystem, uh, you'll see these are a tool, uh, a, a group of technologies that are, are accelerating the convergence of open source, where, where machine learning and big data together is better. So, so obviously, you know, applying machine learning concepts is not new, but before it used to be done in samples, you couldn't do full, full observations of all your, your, your data points. So now with Spark, you can use all data and build your models. But if you look at the, the ecosystem here, Python has a huge data science ecosystem already. But now you can work with it at Big Data and Spark. And then R has another ecosystem of tools uh, that are available to work with. And now you can work with the Spark. And we're embracing all of these inside our, our data science experience platform today so that people can really not worry about tools, but just you know, pick the best of what they're trying to do with the technologies that are available. Just the thing to remember, Spark works well with R and Python. <laughs> so it's really good to remember. Oh, and one thing I wanted to mention here is Jupyter is a notebook interface. It's kind of like a, an IDE for developers on Python. So now you can use Jupyter to really do, uh, I didn't have a slide on notebooks, but it's, it's a way to write code, get back results, just create a graph, you know, kind of like build this model in a, uh, it, it, you know, back and forth computer and man, we, and you hear that a lot today. So um, it's a nice tool that, that's really cool to work with. This button is bothering me. Oh, there we go. So IBM is all in on Spark. We're invested in Spark in three ways. Uh, we're contributing to the community. So this we call it contribute to the core. So Apache Spark is a project in the uh, Apache Software Foundation. We have a company, uh, a the Spark Technology Center based in San Francisco that has engineers that all they do is contribute code to the open source community. And you know, we, we don't really, we do that because obviously we, we like Spark, but we also, be, we big users of Spark. So we put it in our software. So that's what we're doing, uh, infuse the portfolio, which is kind of messed up there, but. So we infuse the portfolio with Spark. So if you, if you think about Watson, you hear a lot about Watson, Watson uses Spark. So under the covers, he's using Spark. It's not all Spark. Watson has a lot to him, but it has Spark under there as well. And then we're also uh, fostering community. So we're, we're embracing training courses. Um, we, we have a big data university, which you can go take classes. So we're teaching people more, our companies, about data science and big data and why it's important for them to learn this technology and start to embrace it and make that journey. One thing to keep in mind, here in the DC area, I run all the time. Um, some Spark classes, and we have one actually coming up soon. So if any of you are interested, you know, see me afterwards, and I can give you a uh, contact to get uh, signed up to join those. And they're basically one-day class. You come in, and you start out. It's all hands-on. You start out in the beginning of the day not knowing anything, and when you leave, you're 
build a machine learning model. So it's pretty cool. So IBM contri contribution. So we have uh, 38,000 lines of Spark code that we've contributed, and we have uh, 863 JIRAs, and we contributed System ML, which is a, um, a, a, a way to distribute some of your, your algorithms. And then um, we have a lot of commits, 422. So over the last year and a half since Spark technology started, we actually have grown to um, the uh, number two contributor for Spark 2.0, buying Databricks, which is a founding company. So um, we're, we're contributing heavily. But if you take the next five companies and combine their contributions, they still don't equal what we're contributing. And we have the second most committers now, too. And then if you look here at the, the, the areas we're investing in, so it's in SQL, which yeah, IBM created SQL, which makes a lot of sense, uh, machine learning, and Python. So those are the target areas that IBM has been investing heavily in. And a matter of fact, I think the next slide, you'll see that our machine learning contributions is the most uh, in, in Spark, uh, Spark ML and MLlib 2.0. So we're, we're contributing even more than the founders and creators of Spark uh, because we believe machine learning is a critical thing that companies need to start embracing in their solutions. So what is machine learning? I think everybody might know what it is, kind of, but just let's be clear. So if I, when my first programming exercise when I was 14, I wrote, uh, print Carlo is cool, and then the next line I say, go back to line 10. So it's sort of the whole screen say Carlo is cool, which is kind of cool. But that's not machine learning. That's just explicitly programmed, line by line code. Machine learning is where uh, computers learn without being explicitly programmed. So it is programmed, but it's not explicitly told what to do. It's a combination of your data with an algorithm that some really smart person created. You, you merge those two together to really uh, have a supervised learning of that data by that model, by that algorithm. And then the output is a scored model that you can score predictions against. So that's really what machine learning is. It's not cognitive. Uh, cognitive actually is a combination of a bunch of machine learning things with context and known data points. and other things that make up um, what cognitive is. Machine learning is not new to IBM. Uh, we, back in 52, 1952, uh, before I was born, we wrote a computer to learn to program, play checkers. You could probably run that on uh, your phone now. Probably. But 1997, uh, Big Blue, uh, Deep Big Blue beat the world champion in chess. That was a machine learning concept. And then 2011, obviously, Watson beats the competitor Jeopardy. So, so we've been playing with machine learning for a while. So let's talk about an example of a new digital engagement, you know, uh, of how you can deploy ML models merged with cognitive capabilities. So here's an example of a company we worked with that took a bunch of data on um, um, properties in New York, their electric bill, and parameters like how many stories they were, how many plugs they had, how many windows, what kind of structure it was. And they build these models to, uh, to, to create a way to see what is efficient and what's not. And then they put this cognitive chat bot in front of it, and it says, um, you, know, you know, hey, tell us about the place that you live and how efficient it is. And it says, um, why don't you take a picture of your building? And they took a picture of it. And then it can come back and it'll tell them that it, it could basically parse that image in pixels. And there's a learned model behind the scenes around how to parse that image. And it could tell if the building has you know, two stories, if it's window, if it's concrete, and give them efficiency rating based on the model that they've trained from all of the energy consumption in New York City. And it, it, it was pretty cool because it was a new way of thinking about, hey, OK, so I'm going to do this data science project. I'm going to build this model, a regression model, this very simple machine learning model. And then I'm going to apply that with a chatbot on top of it to say, now have this interaction with somebody that could just take a picture, and it could get the parameters that are building, and then based on that model, give them an estimate if they're efficient or not. So if you're shopping for a property and say, hey, I want to see how efficient this is, you know, I usually have to ask the realtor, I'm like, what was their last electric bill? And they're like, oh, it's like 100 bucks. But in Florida, we all know, I live in Florida, it's like five hundred dollars because the, the power is high for AC. You guys are not laughing. 
It's supposed to be funny. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> so that's a kind of a cool use case. And then, uh, but if you, you think about how we did it, um, really, I mean, we hired a, a, kid, a, a guy out of college. Uh, he's R, Python, he had all those skills. And in a couple weeks, he built a, a model in, in data science experience, a platform for, for open source development and data science. He built the parameters, the input parameters, and then he built this dashboard that we could look at the, the points and different things with Shiny. So I talked about the capabilities before. He used R, Shiny, he used Python, and Apache Spark. And all those together, he built this model. And then, you know, and you'll probably, if you go to the build section, you'll see that he took these cognitive capabilities we have and tied that model on the backside to it and was able to build the chat bot that we showed earlier. And I would demo this for you, but I can't really plug my laptop in here. But, but uh, if you go to the demo station, I think he might be able to pull this up. He might get mad at me. But I could go over there and meet you later and show you <laughs> what it looks like. So it's kind of a neat uh, way of, uh, of taking a data science project and then applying it to something that's really you know, tangible and practical to use. Uh, another example is um, using Apache Spark. And this is actually SETI Institute. You probably, I don't know if anybody else has talked about it, but we, we uh, worked with them to take all of these, uh, tele these data points that they collect for listening out into space, and then we're able to create this interactive plot using Jupyter Notebook, and, um, and they basically pulled together millions of rows of data, unstructured data, pulled it all into a data store, which is object storage, and then taken Jupyter, which is that interface to do the development, data science development, and Spark, merge it together and kind of create those patterns. I don't realize how much time I got left. All right, good. And uh, so, so how do you get started if you guys want to start coding with this? Um, so first, you sign up for uh, your free DXN experience at www.datascience.ibm.com. Um, and it has Apache Spark and R and Python. Then you can uh, start to take some tutorials in there. Uh, um, there's search on how to use notebooks and how to do, I wrote actually three labs on uh, Apache Spark. Uh, it's, it's intro to Apache Spark, intro to Apache Spark SQL and machine learning. I recommend you take those. And then you can go out to GitHub and I, I, the, the model analysis that I showed you is available for you to download. Uh, pick a single data science use case for your neck of the woods and your job. And then just email me with questions and I'll help you. I'm not very responsive, just so you know. <laughs> just so you know, I'm not very, email's terrible. Uh, so that's all I got, so I think we should open it up for q and A. it would be perfect. If anybody's got questions. This guy's got a question, I know he does. No? So we have one scheduled August 30, I think it's Frank, is August 31st? Uh, yeah, if we have enough people, we can do one early. So we can do the intro to Apache Spark pretty frequently. We can do those quickly. Um, the one that we're doing December, or August 31st is uh, intro to, or data science on the cloud. It's a little different. It's more around learning about data science concepts. Um, but we have a couple things we could do to help people get started. Yes, sir. I can repeat the question for him. Is Apache Spark run on Hadoop platform or is it separate? So yes and yes. So Spark, uh, a lot of the clients I'm working with now, I mean, you can run Spark on a Hadoop cluster. Spark's part, Hadoop is a distribution, a bundle of a bunch of open source projects. And that's where the challenge comes with Hadoop. I, I mean, I embrace Hadoop a lot in the past and I'm not, it's, I'm getting Hadoop fatigue, I think. But it's just like you have Hive for SQL, you have Storm for streaming, you have HDFS for storage. So um, Spark is one of those projects that you can use. But a lot of clients I'm working with now, Spark, we're, we're, we're building Spark only clusters. Just install Spark for the data science workload, um, use object storage as your storage facility or HDFS or Cassandra, whatever you want. But, um, but just use Spark for that workload because um, Hadoop comes with a bunch of stuff and, 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 you know, more that people use this, like, for example, Kafka comes in Hadoop, 
but a lot of people that use Kafka heavily have their own Kafka cluster. So I recommend a Spark only cluster as you get more into it. But to start, just use it in the cloud is a lot easier. <laughs> yeah. No problem. Yes, sir. Yeah. So the question is, um, talk about the analytics on Spark, is if Spark will replace the typical snow schema or cube that you would use in, in, in an analytics. Um, it can. I mean, some of the workload in Spark can replace that type of workload that you would typically do in that star schema. But I don't think that's going to go away, in my opinion. Too, there's a lot of companies and, and people that are building their, their data warehouses in the star schema because that serves a lot of purposes more than advanced analytics, you know, simple reporting, simple aggregates, and, and simple dashboards. Um, and Spark doesn't do, won't replace all that, in my opinion, right out of the get-go. Um, Spark is really good for taking the analytics to the digital endpoint. That's where Spark is very good, um, in my opinion. But it's also good, I mean, I had a use case slide, I must have took it out. Uh, it's also good for BI and reporting, so there's a lot of people that are using it for that. But I don't think, this, to, your, to your point, I don't think the star schema and that approach will go away. I just think that this new technology has more to offer now because there's a lot less cost associated with beginning to use uh, new data points and new types of data for analytics. Does that, does that answer your question? Yes. Sure. The question is, when I'm with customers and um, using Spark, PySpark, uh, with, with, uh, for Python analytics, do we see customers using some SciPy, NumPy? They do use some SciPy, NumPy. That's why we bundle it in our data science experience platform. So you can use uh, Spark, uh, PySpark, and you use that for things such as um, you know, dealing with a large data frame that needs to be distributed. Um, when you take the class, I'll teach you more about how that's broken up. I th you actually took my class, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, and so NumPy and SciPy definitely is used, and we, so, so there's, there's value in that. Um, it's just not distributed, so you just got to be aware. <laughs> All right, thanks. That wasn't set up either, just so you know. <laughs> Any other questions? I think we got a couple minutes. Yes, sir. Yeah, we do. We did one in Chicago. We had over 120 people. So, if you live in Chicago, we do them all over the U.S. I'll get your card, or I'll give me my card. It's on. Well, there's two. I, I wrote up the first one I created was all on Spark, just teaching you about Spark, and then we're working on a new one now that that we're starting to kind of train people on is around data science only. Um, but, uh, the, the, but I'm also working on one that's just on machine learning. Because there's a lot of layers to this stuff. I mean, it goes deep. And I try to keep it high level for the conversation, but when you start to use it, you know, for machine learning, you really got to understand, do I apply a, you know, a classification? Do I apply a regression? I mean, so the, those are all the things I want to try to do in the machine learning class. And data science class touches on that, but it also touches on some other concepts as well. Cool. I think we're done. Thanks. <laughs>